Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Some of you are. Here's the reality, though. We know that some of you aren't. So you don't have to hoorah. Uh, there's, uh, there's, it's, it's life. There's, there's incredible things going on. There's some terrible things going on. Uh, there's heartbreaking things going on. Even this morning, prayed for a major breakthrough uh, with somebody and something they've been asking God for for eight years. Uh, and, and God showed up in a way that you can't explain it otherwise. And then this morning, I've prayed with a couple people who are uh, uh, looking forward to, uh, not in a positive way, just as looking forward down the road of their calendar, knowing that people they deeply love will be passing uh, very soon. And so, uh, so as we gather and worship, uh, all that's in this room, uh, and we're glad to come before the Lord in that. I do want to announce, if you've been around Moraine for a while, you know that we like to announce uh, when, uh, when we have uh, new uh, babies who are born into the church, into our families. Uh, and, uh, and a couple months ago, we uh, mentioned uh, Craig's mom, uh, Craig uh, and, and Carolyn, who are the missionaries, Craig's mom passing. And this morning, I just want to let you know, too, that uh, Steve Jeminer, uh, who has been a part of our church for a long time, uh, passed unexpectedly uh, this past Thursday. Uh, complications with a lot of things. Uh, so we're praying with Mary for, her, uh, for their families uh, and just covering them in, in prayer as they walk through that. Services are July 1st, uh, but times haven't been figured out yet. So we'll uh, mention all that stuff when it comes. So please be praying with them and for them. And, and then with um, Craig and Carolyn as well, uh, Russ and as they're with us, would love for you to know they're in the room. Craig, where are you guys at? There we go. Okay, can everybody just wave at them so we know that? Okay, there we go. Uh, we'd love for you, if you walk straight out the doors, you'll run into them, all right? And so uh, don't make it like the awkward eye contact where you say nothing, go up, say hi, get to know what they're doing and what they're a part of. Uh, it's good to know because we're uh, connected with so many global outreach partners, people who are serving all over the place, uh, and we want you to know the people, uh, and rarely, oftentimes, uh, we don't get a chance, or all of us won't get a chance to go see what they're doing, where they're doing it, though I hope some of us get to make those trips. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an incredible experience when we get to have them come to be with us. Uh, and so would you please, uh, if nothing else, introduce yourself, give them a hug, let them know, uh, and as they uh, ask them for what they're praying for and how you can partner with them personally as well. And so uh, we want to uh, just be grateful uh, for all of that. And so uh, let's, uh, let's stand as we read Jesus' teaching from the Bible in Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Uh, this is the last section of uh, Matthew chapter 5. Now, Jesus didn't say, okay, now we're moving into chapter 6. We added all that later. Uh, but in this, uh, there is a conclusion of thought that started uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 2, as we launched in the Beatitudes, that he's wrapping up, uh, and, and, and if anything, it's this perfect bookend. It's almost this culmination of everything that's been said. And so I will read from Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourself to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes this, his son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do, they do not do the same. And if you greet only your brother and sister, what more are you than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Let's pray. Fathers, we jump into this section of this teaching from Jesus. Um, Father, what you are causing us to do is not wrestle with concepts or try to figure out what we think about them, but to actually do them, to put it into practice, to make it a part of our life, that this would be part of our witness, part of our Christian journey of discipling to become more like Jesus. God, this isn't an exception. Uh, you've called us all to it. And so, Lord, would you guide us through this thought and this word uh, so that we can uh, sift through, your spirit can sift through our lives uh, and help us see where we've fallen out of alignment. God, would you just... Would you bring us, would your spirit empower us and, and pull us in to be more and more like Christ? It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. 
And over the last couple of weeks, I've had a lot of these conversations where it's like, hey, buddy, can, you, can we go easy for a Sunday? You know, uh, it uh, regularly feels like God's digging into some areas and poking on some stuff and moving in some things. And if you can convince Jesus to go easy on you, sure, uh, we're just going through his teaching. So I have no part in that. However, as we go through this, you can see he's not letting up. Uh, he's digging into some deep areas. We've talked about this before. Uh, Jesus isn't, uh, he didn't come to teach behavioral modification, right? Uh, that we just shift how we're acting. Uh, he transforms who we're being. Uh, that there's a death to our old way of life so we can rise and walk in this new life through and with him. And so we have these teachings from Jesus uh, where the disciples say, that's not, how, how are we supposed to live up to that? And Jesus responds, well, on your own, it's impossible. But through God, all things are possible. And so we read this, not saying, oh, that's, that's an interesting teaching that I'm sure helps somebody. We read this saying, no, Jesus is serious. Uh, this is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And as we walk in that way, uh, we just saying that we believe that God is more than able and that anything is possible. So as we jump into the topic of how do we love our enemies and pray for those who come against us, we've got to believe that that becomes surrendered under that same prayer. What I'd love for you to do as we jump in is this, would you make a list on your phone? I would suggest try to do it somewhere where you can see it. Uh, if you're like me, your, your brain is not as much of a steel trap as a jello mold. Uh, and so uh, if you could just write down some names of people that come to mind when you think of people who are your enemies, specifically the language gives us the idea that these are ones who are coming for you and mean harm to you. So if you have people like that, write them down. The reality, though, for a lot of us in this room is you may not have someone like that, so I'd love for you to make a different kind of list. Make a list of people that for you are hard to love. And all of a sudden, we've got a long list. I I've, uh, would articulate this way. Socially, uh, I am somebody, I just assume that we're friends if we smile at each other, right? Uh, I, it's, it doesn't take like years of application processes uh, because I wouldn't have any friends. No one would let me in. But uh, for me, I, I assume, right, we're either, uh, we're either friendly, right, or, or you frustrate me. Those are kind of my two modes, right? And oftentimes when we talk about this, what it means to love our enemies, for me, it's I don't know it's hard for me to come up with a list of people that I feel like are my enemy. It's extremely easy for me to come up with a list of people that I kind of brush off as I'd be too hard to love them. Maybe it's certain names. Maybe these for you are people groups. Uh, maybe for some in this room, if we can dig a little bit deeper, are political candidates or parties. Maybe for some of you in this room, they're supporters of certain causes or people who don't support certain causes, there are people who it's hard for you to love because all you can see is the bad. You with me? All you can see is the evil. All you can see is that. I'd love for you to hold those names in front of you as we go. Jesus is addressing an area of our life that we don't often disciple. We let God have free reign over a couple areas of our life. There's a few that we don't. It's like, oh, money sermon? Nope, don't touch that, uh, right? I, I remember the first time I ever preached on fasting, and I remember thinking, I would rather be preaching on money than on not eating, right? Uh, and so we've got all these different things like, okay, God, you can mess with some stuff. You can't mess with other stuff. Uh, uh, for a lot of us, conceptually, we're like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, you're supposed to love everybody. Cool. We'll love the people on the list you just made. And it's like, well, some of them, right? Oftentimes, we don't disciple this area so that we can go on justifying our frustration, our anger, and even our hatred. Well, why aren't you actively loving them? And then we're like, well, yeah, but you don't know. And right, all of a sudden, the justification starts. Here's why I don't. Here's why I get to hold back what God's called me to give away. Matthew chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And we hear this, and obviously we know that love your neighbor. We hear it over and over in Jesus' teaching. He repeats it a couple times, uh, but it goes all the way back. He says, you've heard it said. That's in Leviticus chapter 19, 18. We, we read it last week. And in here, in Leviticus, we read, you shall not take vengeance, 
nor hold any grudge. Some of you need to take a screenshot of that image on the screen and go through it this week. Against the sons of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. As though he gives this signature at the end, uh, he, he took it to get stamped, right? It's been verified. God said this. He calls us to it. It's expected. And then we go into the, right? You've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Everyone knows that verse in scripture, right? For some of you, it's your favorite verse. But wait, there's nowhere in scripture where it actually says to hate your enemy. Can't find a single verse for it. God doesn't say it. In fact, there are many places where it says to care for your enemy and maybe even to love them. Jesus said, you've heard it was said. That doesn't mean that what you heard said came from scripture. It's most assumed uh, that this saying that was heard came from uh, developed in Jewish teaching tradition and practices, meaning it didn't come from God's mouth. It came from best practices along the way. And it makes a little bit of sense. It seems that when they heard love your neighbor, they assumed that you then don't have to love someone who wasn't your neighbor. Jesus is not addressing an understanding of scripture. He's addressing a misunderstanding of scripture. Takes away the justification, removes it. Jesus flushes out this truth in this instance we read in Luke chapter 10. In verse 25, it says, and look, an expert in Jewish instruction stood up and put Jesus to the test. You know this story. Teacher, what shall I do? Pay attention to the verbs here. He wants to know what actionably. What am I supposed to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law and how does it read to you? Right? The Don International Version is, you're the expert in the law. You tell me. And he goes on and he says this, he answered, you shall love the Lord with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength and with all of your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Read the next word with me. Do, sorry, I know the slides were a little, there we go. Do this and you will live. He doesn't say, cool, now form up a Bible study, do a good uh, Hebrew exegesis on what the word do means, right? It kind of goes back to that 90s political, it depends on what the definition of is is, right? Yeah, okay, it says do this, but like, what does it mean to do? You know, I, maybe not everything, okay? So he says, do this and you will live. But wanting to justify, how quick of a shift is it for this guy? He goes from testing Jesus to now having to justify himself. Jesus is good. And Jesus said, and he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And that's the question we all ask. In some way asking, who do I have to love? And then the other side of that is, who don't I have to love? Right? And let's not pretend like we've not tried to figure out what those lists are and then justify what our answers are to those lists. But pay attention to the story Jesus gives. We'll read it through quickly. Jesus replied and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he encountered robbers. And they stripped him and beat him and they went away leaving him half dead. And by coincidence, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side, here's the hard part. This man's spiritual family and even leaders in authority over him walk past him when he's left half dead. But a Samaritan, and for us, many of you, the longer you've been around church, the more you've done this study. But the reality is for the group of people Jesus is teaching to, uh, the Jewish people had a degraded view of Samaritans. It's not who they would consider to be a neighbor but maybe not exactly who they consider to be an enemy, but they certainly weren't towards the neighbor side. But when a Samaritan who was on a journey came up to him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. Literally, his stomach turned. He was caused to do something and came to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them, and he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him and whatever more you spend when I return, I will repay you. Here's my credit card, rack it up for whatever this man needs. Jesus asked, which of these three, only gives him the three options, do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed great compassion to him. Jesus said to him, go and what? Do the same. You got to do it. You have to put it into practice. You have to live this way. You have to become the kind of person whose instinct and reaction is to love. And not like this warm, fuzzy, conceptual idea of love to physically show up and love. Love in the kind of way where your money's involved and your time's involved and your energy's involved and the relational stuff you've got in you that makes you feel tired and spent, you don't know what to do with it, you give that too. And not to the people who agree with you on everything or who side with you on everything, to the one who needs it that you come across. This word for compassion and mercy there at the end in verse 37 is the same word we read. It means this. It's, it's that loving kindness. It's the word we talked about a few months ago in Matthew chapter 5, 7, where Jesus says, blessed are the merciful because they will receive mercy. And what this man's able to see is it's the Samaritan guy who physically, actually, in real life loved him. That's what mercy looks like. That's what this hesed in the Old Testament, loving kindness, loyal family style, uh, um, covenant level love looks like. Go and do the same. And there's the charge to stop spending our time engaged in these kinds of arguments. Remember the expert in the law came up to engage in a really lively theological thing, trying to pin Jesus into a corner, right? He's wanting to engage his mind. Jesus says, no, you need to engage the rest of your life. And that's a word a lot of us need. To go do the same. Show God's hesed, loyal, loving kindness, compassionate mercy to those who come across you and need someone just to stop and show up to them. When we celebrate this Emmanuel, God with us, it's the incarnation of Jesus where he comes to actually be with us when we couldn't go be with him. So don't be surprised when God calls us to go be with people who are hard to love. That's what Jesus does. And it's that same flow and it's that same move that we're called into. In verse 44 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus continues his teaching. He says, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So that, it's a wild qualifying statement, you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. These are the family rules. This is how God's family acts. This is if you are adopted as a son or daughter into God's family. Family, these are our values. This is who we are. This is how we live. This is how we love. Why? Because dad gets to make the rules. And our heavenly father said this is how it's called to be. This is, I would say, I would put this as a contender for one of Jesus' most radical teachings and expectations. This command challenges how we live and how we love and who we love. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this in Cost of Discipleship, the will of God to which the law gives expression is that men should defeat their enemies by loving them. Not arguing with them until you feel like you're justified and right. Not pinning them into a hole with every biblical truth you've ever learned so that they know that you know more than they know. You're on God's side. They're clearly not. It's to love them. Jesus is calling us to view our enemies as brothers and sisters to be loved. That's radical. When he says love your enemies, we need to stop and recalibrate what we think of when we think of love. Because the word love for us is a movie and story genre, right? It can cause us to think about romantic, mushy feelings, precious thoughts. 
Oftentimes, love for us, when we say it, I can say I love my wife, but I could also tell you I love a ribeye. Amen? All right. Now, I'd tell you in that order, I love my wife, okay? But we can love a lot of things. I love football, right? I love traveling. I love sleeping. I love a lot of things. And so that word love has got a scale and it's got variables and it could mean a lot of different, oftentimes it kind of just becomes this soft, gentle emotion. So when Jesus says to love your enemy, we're like, yeah, we love people. Well, what about that one? No, but what, I love people though. Well, what about that person? Not that person, but I do love people. You get what I'm saying? We have this concept that we love people, but we don't have a practice of it. We need to rethink Love, if we're going to get our hands around this, it's not a feeling. It is an action derived from our soul's intent because of what God's done in here and who we are. It moves out in the way that we actually show up to care for and take care of people. It's not just the exceptional hardcore Christians who are called to this. It's to every follower of Jesus who is consistent in all their ways. Get it? You can't love here but not there. Jesus didn't do that. You can't show mercy here but not over there. Jesus didn't do that either. It's to every follower of Jesus who can sit in their ways. We don't just love some like God. We love all. A common reality, if you look around, are believers who justify ourselves by actionably loving an enemy and somehow we think we can't do that because it might condone their evil. Well, here's another theological reality. Not once did Jesus love his enemies and condone their sin or evil. So you can get that one off the plate. If we love in the way Christ loved, we don't have to worry about all the reasons why we don't have to love them or what happens when we do. It doesn't condone their evil. What it does is it represents God's goodness. How terrible is it that we can become so comfortable in our unmerited, grace-filled new life in Christ that we end up becoming combative with others who are still in their old life. As though we've arrived somewhere and it puts us on a pedestal and we've got it and they don't. Read through the life of Christ and tell me where that theology comes from. Jesus is teaching and expecting his disciples to consider what is best for the other person even if the other person is an enemy. He says, pray for those who persecute you. This is directly tied to Jesus' example we read last week on retaliation. We don't get even, we show grace. Praying for our enemy is not a sentimental gesture, right? And oftentimes we'll do that, and the scripture even speaks against it, where uh, we'll say, you know, oh, something's going on. It's like, yeah, no, no, man, I'll be praying for that. And then someone's like, hey, I have a report, and they start saying something. You're like, I don't remember you saying anything. Why? Because we never actually prayed for it. And what we find is Jesus saying, no, actually go to the Father on their behalf. Think of it this way. It's not a sentimental gesture or an assumption with no action. Praying for our enemy is the action of going to God on their behalf and asking God for their best. Within the last decade, and I won't tell you which part of it, I found myself getting very disgruntled with the way politicians were behaving. And what I noticed is that I was complaining a lot and I was getting frustrated a lot and I can find myself in a place where uh, all of a sudden I turn people I've never even met into enemies that I don't even know if I really have. And here's the difference. I was challenged to print off, I had to go find it, a list of the names of their children and pray for them as a father. Pray for them as a husband. Pray for them as a leader. Uh, pray for their marriage and the health of that. Pray that they would draw close to their kids as they were leading. You get what I'm saying? Why? Because all of a sudden, when you start praying for people that God would move in their best interest, something shifts in your heart where you realize these are people. Now, if you haven't figured out yet, I've loved the writings of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's got a lot to say here. He says, for if we pray for them, we are taking their distress and poverty, their guilt and their perdition upon ourselves and pleading to God for them. He says in his book, Life Together, in intercessory prayer, in intercessory prayer, the face that may have been strange and intolerable to me is transformed into the face of the one whom Christ died, the face of a pardoned sinner. As far as we are concerned, 
There is no dislike, no personal tension, no disunity or strife that cannot be overcome by intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is the purifying bath into which the individual and the community must enter every day. Mind you, this is a guy trying to lead a gospel-centered seminary in the middle of Nazi Germany, saying you should pray for your enemies. In the same way, when our New Testament writers are saying pray for your kings and authorities, or in our words, presidents and leaders, uh, the language is this. He's writing that during the reign of Nero. Go Google that one. And see if it matters how good they are before you do this. What he's reminding us over and over is when we pray for people, it may not shift them, but it'll shift stuff in us. What happens when we ask God's favor for the one who hates us or even the one we hate or are hard to love? The question is, is it possible to fervently pray for someone and continue to hate them? My experience is, God starts shifting some stuff around and the issue may not be on them as much as it is on me. Verse 45, Jesus continues, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. This isn't about heat and storms. It's about allowing the good and evil both opportunities for new days. The rain in an agricultural society is more about provision and sustaining and refreshment. God's goodness is given to the evil and the good alike. Verse 46, for if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, do they not do the same? Even evil people still love other people. So when we love those who love us back, that doesn't put our righteousness in a different league. It just makes us like everyone else. There's no holiness there. And then he goes on, and if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles, do they not do the same? Uh, Get that question, what more are we doing? Where do we hear that last? Jesus saying, unless your righteousness is more than, greater than, far surpassing that of the Pharisees. We're called to more. This word to greet in the Greek language is to bring oneself or to bring to oneself or to embrace. Go for the hug. Really bring them in and embrace them. Are there any huggers in the room? Three. Good. Good to be a part of this church then. My man. Thank you. All right. I see that hand. Any of you walk around with tasers in case anyone comes very close to you? All right. Well, we have deacons and elders praying at the end of service. You are welcome to come forward. But what he's saying is, bring them in. Not hold them at an arm's distance. Not stop short of what God's called us to. We don't just welcome and embrace people like us, but we do the same for people who don't. What more are you doing? Don't forget, Jesus already called us to a surpassing greater righteousness. So greater is our righteousness if we are, how great is our righteousness if we're only loving people that the rest of the world loves? In verse 48, we get to that rough one-liner. Thank you, Jesus. Therefore, you shall be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And in here, we get this reminder that God's called us to. Now, this word's gonna get flushed out. We'll talk through it. But if you want a Bible verse to memorize and keep in front of you, this might be a good picture for you to take. Because that's what we're called to. But it's not perfection in the way of that there's no sin, but perfection in the way that we've been made complete and whole. There's no cracks in our life or in our character. That there's been a old that's gone, but there's in this new life that's been restored. That one was built for eternity. Listen to this part of the sermon in Luke to get a full picture. I'd love for you to pay attention to the way of being in the world that Jesus is instructing his disciples to follow. We've been reading out of Matthew, but Luke records uh, the Sermon on the Mount. So listen to some of the differences. Luke chapter 6, 27, but I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who are abusive to you. Now, this will sound familiar because he goes back and takes some of the stuff we already talked about. 
Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him also the other. Whoever takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic from his either. Give to anyone or everyone who asks of you. And whoever takes away what is yours, don't demand it back. Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? And in this, what I'd love for you to listen and hear for is Jesus saying, listen, don't have outstanding debts with people, whether it's you or them. Because all of a sudden, right, I'm the guy that if I borrow your tool, it's going to be a little bit before I return it. Just full disclosure, all right? Because I forget and I move on and guess what can happen in some ways. I don't know why, how could you be so inconsiderate? I don't know why they don't, blah, blah, blah. And failing to realize like life just moved on and, and sometimes you forget what Jesus is saying. Listen, just be in a kind of way where you are generous. Why? Because if you seek first the kingdom is righteousness, everything's going to be given to you. So you don't have to hold on to stuff. You need to hold on to people. And in this, Jesus continues, and if you lend to those, oh, sorry, even sinners lend to, the, to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. Verse 35, but love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil people. Is there anyone thankful that he's been kind to you? Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. And it takes us back to that idea of loving kindness. Not because you're incredible, though I like you, right? Not because we've got it all figured out, we don't. But because God is a God of love, that's why he loves. He's got a loyal, covenantal, promising, stick with you kind of love that you can't break. So why should we love and pray for our enemy? The first one is this. We're called to be like God. I don't know if I need a second point, but I've got one. Because God does. That's why we do. Because he's asked us to, commanded us to, taught us to, and expects us to. We are called to be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. Not sinless perfect, though God is that. But the idea of perfect here is the idea of wholeness or fulfillment or completion. It's this idea that in us, in our character, in our life, there's no cracks in it. Uh, in the Beatitudes, it looks like the one that says blessed are the pure in heart or pure of heart. That there's no junk in there. It's been sifted through. It's, it's operating out of a system that doesn't have anything to hold back and has everything to give away. The kind of heart that beats for whoever's around them. Why? Because the Father's beat, heart beats for all creation. Singularly devoted to loving God with everything and loving our neighbor, including our enemy. Being perfect is a good summary of what it means to have a righteousness that by far surpasses that of the Pharisees. Because even though they were doing the right stuff, they weren't loving out of the right place. In Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, we read uh, this, for I am the Lord who brought you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God, for you shall be holy. Why? Because he's holy. And then he goes on in Luke chapter six, verse 36, we just read it. He said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Ephesians chapter five, verse one says this, therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children, be like your dad. Look at him. Watch the way he works. Put his shoes on like a toddler with their dad and run around. Want to be like him. And walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us. Do you hear the call over and over? We're not just called to be with him and to try to become like him, but to actually do the things that he's doing. If you walk in love just as Christ loved you and gave himself up for you, then we will walk with the people that Jesus also walked among who were far from God. Because I'm grateful he came and walked around people like us. Amen? 
Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, it says he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is generously good to everyone, neighbor and enemy, evil and good. So we, in imitating God, being holy and merciful and loving and completion, will love and pray for the people around us, whether that's a neighbor or an enemy, whether it's someone who's easy to love or hard to love, someone who's been unbelievably good to us or unbelievably not. The second one is this. Why should we love and pray for our enemies? Because it's our testimony. Don't forget, Jesus says, this is how people are going to know that you're my disciples. It's by the way that you love each other. And church, let me remind you, it's hard enough to love the people in this room, let alone all the people in the world that are outside of it. This is, in some ways, this is kind of like our pre-training. This is, uh, uh, these are our two-a-days before we get into the schedule. You know what I mean? How do we love each other in here? How do we talk to each other? How do we bring up issues? How do we approach conflict? How do we handle disagreements? How do we settle things where we don't naturally agree with it, but we don't know what to do with it? How do we handle those things? Because it's our testimony. The way we love people in here will let people know whether or not we're following Jesus. We cannot just love people who love us back, and we can't just welcome our own people. That's how the rest of the world operates. But Paul writes to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 14, and says, do all things without complaining or arguments. We could stop there. But you do understand this is in Scripture, right? This is our field guide for life. These are the words of God breathed out of his mouth and into our nostrils, giving life to who we are in our new life. You're following with me, right? Do everything without complaining or arguments. I don't know what the world around us says about the church, but my guess is that verse may not be up there. But he says to do it so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you appear as lights in the world. Hold firmly the word of life. Warren Wearsby says a As Christians, we must return good for evil as an investment of love. We are God's children representing a heavenly father as we go. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Be like the father. Become like him in all that he does. Don't justify who gets cut out. I'm thankful God didn't do that to us. Love, and we love, and we love. In the 1993 prayer breakfast, Mother Teresa got up and and gave a definition of love. It says, love means giving until it hurts. And my guess is, if you've not gave that much, you may not be practicing love. We live different because we've died to this old way and are walking in our new risen life in Christ. Someone better notice. People uh, who make themselves to be hostile with kingdom people should have a front row seat to our testimony of how we've been transformed and made new. The reality for us is this. How can we love and pray for our enemies? We crucify and we deny ourselves with all of our self-justification of why we don't love our enemy and our neighbor. Here's the reset button we need to hit is to stop operating for how others have treated you and start operating for how Jesus has treated you. That's a good start. How's God been kind? That's how you should be kind. How's God forgiven you? That's how you should forgive. How God's been merciful for, on your life? That's how you should be merciful. How much grace has he poured over everything you need grace for? Anyone? Thought so. Jesus was arrested in the cover of darkness, put on an illegal trial. He was mocked, blindfolded, beaten, passed around from government office to government office while they mocked him, made fun of him, and just passed him on to the other to deal with, made to wear a costume to look like a king and to insult the claim that he was the Messiah, king of the Jews. And then in Luke chapter 23, verse 33, as he's hanging on the cross for the sins of people, 
It says, when they came to him to the place called the Skull or Calvary, they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. But Jesus was saying, I love the word, but Jesus was doing something different. They were attacking, they were mocking, they were beating, they were jeering at him, they were crucifying him, but Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. Be imitators of God. Be holy as he's holy. Be merciful as he's merciful. Be perfect, whole, complete, lacking nothing in the way he is. Imagine praying and interceding for your execution team. But don't forget, while you are deciding how we will treat your others and pray for your enemies, don't forget how God treats his enemies. Romans chapter 5 verse 10 says, for if while we were enemies, uh uh-oh, while we were enemies of God. See, it doesn't give us the option of whether we were good people, just not on God's team. There's no spiritually neutral area where we land in. While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Look at how the early church reacted and obeyed Jesus' teaching. Stephen uh, just gets done in Acts chapter 7 proclaiming this powerful message. And people are infuriated, so they rush him out of town and begin killing him by hurling large stones at him. And Acts chapter 7, 59 says this, and they went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. That sounds like someone who took Jesus serious. Paul taught in Romans chapter 12, 14 to bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then in 1 Corinthians, he writes in chapter four, when we are verbally abused, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we reply as friends. We have become as scum to the world, as dregs of all things, even until now. He says, I do not write these things to shame you, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I've become your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you, be imitators of me. How many people can you say that to? Watch how I treat my enemies. And don't act like them. Act like me as I try to act like Christ. As people are complaining, don't act like them. Act like me and listen to how I don't complain. As people belittle and degrade and separate and make others out there, don't do what they're doing. The rest of the world's doing that. But rather, as I follow Christ, imitate me as I imitate him. Can you say that? I'll be the first in line to say, nope, I don't. But much like Paul's calling, do we let go of what's behind and strain towards what's ahead? Is this the direction that we know we need to move in? Is this the calling that we know we're called to move towards? For us to understand the love that we're supposed to give our neighbor and enemy, listen to the Apostle John in 1 John 4, 17. He says, this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we're like Jesus. That's it. As much as we could while we're here, just like him. In as many ways as possible in everything we can. There is no fear in love, but perfect love. Hear that word perfect again? It drives out fear. Literally, it, it, it drives out that which causes us to fly away or flight. The one where we look and say, nope, and then we go the other way. Perfect love drives all that out. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Here's the hard reality. We'll say, yeah, yeah, no, I do love them. Do they know that? Does it show up? How much, look at the way Christ loves us. Have you done that? 
Because again, it gets us out of our affections and our feelings and it puts it into our practice. How do we talk about them? How do we bring them up? How do we uh, display them for people, maybe even our heart? If you rewind in John chapter four and go back to verse nine, he says, this is how God showed his love among us. Remember, while we were his enemies, he sent his one and only son to the world that we might live through him. This is love. Pay attention. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. We love first. Why? Because when we're like our heavenly father, he loved first. You don't wait for your neighbor or your cousin or your family member, or your coworker to get their act together first. Jesus didn't do that for you. We love them first. Church, for those with real enemies who are coming at you, would you love them the way Jesus has loved you? Martin Luther King Jr. said, darkness doesn't drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate doesn't drive out hate, only love can do that. Jesus reminds us, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Fall in line with what John Stott says when he says, listen, if you want to know how to love or how to get at your enemies, love them. Love them. For those who are here who have enemies of your own or at least people who are hard to love, would you believe the gospel? That's my invitation. Would you just believe it? Not agree with it, but hold to it. Cling to it. Know that it's true, not just for you, but for everyone else. And would you die to that way of life so you can truly live through him? Church, Jesus is not offering concepts to consider. He's given us a to-do list for us to make happen. This is who we're called to be, and this is what we're called to go and do likewise. Who will you love? How will you love them? Who do you need to start praying for? If you are apart from God, you can't be spiritually neutral. That doesn't exist. Scripture reminds us that you are not allegiant to God, then you are enemies of God. God loved us, sent Jesus, whose death covered over our sin. Forgiveness and reconciliation are in him and him alone. Would you put to death your old life? Would you repent this word that means stop going in the way that you're going away from him? In this case, would you stop going in the way of revenge? Would you stop pursuing anger and bitterness and division? Would you turn from that towards the Father? Would you believe that he is Lord, that he died for your sins to reconcile you to Christ? And would you surrender your life to Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life? Because the reality is in your old life, it's impossible. But through Christ, all things are possible. And so as we sit in this teaching of Jesus and as we walk out with it, here's my encouragement. Here's what I know can be the tendency. The tendency can be is to hear all of this, feel convicted, walk out, someone cuts you off, and all of a sudden you've made a new enemy. And as quick as it came in, it goes out. Would you sit in this word this week? If you've got a Bible reading plan, could I ask you to do something wild? Would you pause your Bible reading plan and reread this section of scripture over and over and over. Would you be reminded, not only is it the word of God breathed because it's in our canonized scripture, but it's the mouth of Jesus. Teachings from him. In his short life and ministry on earth, this is what he gave us. These aren't just teachings or instructions. These are expectations. This is the family culture of kingdom living in the family of God. Would you stand? As we sing this last song, I want to encourage you. And, and, and I probably need to be reminded, I didn't master this before I got up and taught it, by the way. But what I do know is if I'm going to leave what's behind and strain towards what's ahead, I can see that this needs to be part of what's ahead. I need to let go of some stuff. I need to take hold of Christ. There's some people I need to reimagine, rethink, reprocess. I need to get my mind around this in different ways. 
So as we sing and worship this, if the lyrics are true for you, would you in some way, I don't know if it's a physical, I don't know how you want, would you just, would, would you release whatever you've been holding on to? And at the end of this song, we'll have elders and deacons who are up front. And some of you just need someone to lay a hand. You, you've been caught in bitterness and anger and complaining and frustration for so long, you can't separate it from your identity. Would you come forward and let someone just put a hand on your shoulder and pray that you would let go of all that so you can cling on to Christ? So Father, would you, as we, as we pray and sing and worship through this song, Father, would your spirit move around in the same way it's been doing? Father, would you attach us to those people we need to go to? Would you bring us to the situations we need to settle? Would you bring to light the people groups that we need to reconcile with? Father, we are grateful that it's only because of you and your love for us first through sending Christ as an atoning sacrifice for our sin that we have anything to even put our hands around to understand what you're talking about. Had you not done it first, we have nothing to follow. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, would you help us to become like him? Because it's in his name we pray, amen.